in the day. So I guess a, a bit of housekeeping because we have remote folks there is to make sure you turn your microphones on. Um, but welcome. Um, I get the pleasure today of introducing um, Dr. Chris Ferentinos. Chris and I have worked together on the Unity Project now for the last two years as co-managers from our organizations along with um, other leaders from different organizations. So Chris um, Ferentino, she is the, direct, the Director for Behavioral Health Services at Legacy. Um, and, our, and I'm going to give you a little bit of her bio. Chris Ferentino received her MD in 1988, followed w with psychiatric training at the Rio de Janeiro Federal University. In 1997, she became a co-owner of ChangePoint Incorporated, an outpatient addictions clinic in Portland, she was a member of the National Institute of Drug Abuse Council, sorry, clinical, Drug Abuse Clinical Trials Network from 1999 through 2008. Chris was a key participant in two, in two motivational interviewing randomized clinical trials under the National Institute for Drug Addiction. She has published several, several scientific papers in the U.S. and Brazil. Chris has taught workshops in Oregon and nationally on patient-centered behavioral health interventions and motivational interviewing. She received her MPH from Portland State University in 2006. Dr. Ver Dr. Ferentino's worked from 2008 to 2013 as the Chief Operating Officer for DePaul Treatment Centers, an addiction and mental health agency in Portland, and was the Project Manager for Behavioral Health Integration in a, in a partnership with Legacy Health Systems. Dr. Ferentinos joined Legacy Health in 2013 as the Director for Behavioral Health Services. Legacy is a not-for-profit health system with six hospitals and over 50 clinics in the Portland, Oregon, and Southwest Washington area. As Director for Behavioral Health, she manages the Psychiatric Consult Liaison Team, helped develop an integrated integration program for psychiatric nurse practitioners in primary care, and works on integrating all the legacy behavioral health efforts under one umbrella. In that capacity, Chris is leading the effort on creating Unity Center for Behavioral Health, a collaboration between Legacy, Adventist, OHSU, and Kaiser to consolidate current psychiatric units and to create a 24-7 um, psychiatric emergency um, room located in Portland, Oregon. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. I'm, I very much appreciate. Let's turn my phone off, of course. And um, so Unity Center for Behavioral Health, what, what is all the buzz about it, right? So here we go. Let's talk about it. Um, so the objectives for today are to learn more about um, psychiatric emergency service models and the need to learn about the Alameda model study, um, original approach to addressing ED psychiatric boarding, and also learn more about Unity Behavior, uh, Center for Behavioral Health um, that Cindy just gracefully talked about. Um, at first, I would like to actually share with you just a few slides on the data that we have at Legacy. Uh, we have in all of our hospitals, but I thought that this was a demonstration of the need for doing something different and so far how we actually address patients that have behavioral health problems in uh, our current EDs. So this is just looking at the volume. This is Emanuel Medical Center. It's at one of the legacy uh, um, hospitals. And this is the volume during the last 12 months on the chart, October 2014 through September 2015. If you compare that it's up 26% from the volume in the first 12 months, which is April 12, uh, 2012 to March 2013. And if you look at the number of hours or minutes, if you will, uh, spent with patients um, that are in the ED, it's always going, it's also increased 50% um, over the period of a year. And on a combined basis, uh, the total behavior health hours are up by 61% uh, in our facilities. These are all of our legacy facilities. I bet that's different here, right? You, you, you guys got it all figured out, right? Yeah. So um, an introduction to the challenge that we have ahead. So 2 million people seek treatment annually uh, in the U.S. for behavioral health care problems in hospital emergency departments. A lot of cost goes into that. 
Um, and, and ED staff, I mean, ED staff is great. They, they are absolutely fantastic to address um, medical issues, but some, sometimes are not quite equipped and, and feel burdened by um, um, psychiatric and addictions patients. There is a lot of variation in the expertise, and some EDs are much more well-equipped than others um, across the continuum in the United States. Six to 12 percent of all U.S. ED visits are related to psychiatric complaints. At Legacy, I can tell you that it's 7 percent of our total. So boarding uh, in the USA, studies show uh, an average psychiatric patient in medical emergency departments boarding between 8 to 34 hours. Um, I can tell you that at Legacy, it varies depending on each one of our hospitals. It can vary from um, 20 to 30 hours in some of the very busy hospitals to maybe 10 hours um, in some of our less busy hospitals. Uh, and the study uh, showed that after decision made for psychiatric admissions, average adult waits, uh, average adult waits over 10 hours in California EDs until transferred. And, and there, there's actually this one particular good little study about the cost of actually boarding a psychiatric patient in an, in an ED that comes to um, 2200 uh, and, and this is a lot in the realm of opportunity cost. Um, it, it, a bet is taken, uh, and a lot of hospitals, uh, their, their EDs are the portal to their uh, inpatient units, medical inpatient units. So, so some of that cost uh, comes along with opportunity cost. And the other piece of it is that psychiatric symptoms sometimes get worse during the time that the patient is in the emergency department, not better. So let's talk about uh, the model that we um, researched and found uh, first in um, John George Hospital in Oakland, uh, California and then in several other places that I will talk about in a minute. Um, so these are regional dedicated emergency psychiatric facilities. So, so they are receiving, receiving facilities that can accept walk-ins, ambulance, police directly. Um, medically in, unstable patients still have to go to a medical ED, so we're making here a, a distinction between medical conditions and psychiatric conditions. They are considered outpatient services, no need for a bed. In fact, most programs that we visited, they use recliners in an open therapeutic milieu that we'll talk about more in a minute. So the focus is on relieving acute care, uh, the acute crisis, and in referral, um, not comprehensive psychiatric ev evaluation, but I think, I, I think one of the things that I learned over the journey of the last two years preparing to open um, Unity and, and a psychiatric emergency service is that the motto is quite different than your regular medical ED. The motto is such that instead of being uh, evaluation and disposition, it is a motto that includes evaluation and active treatment and a delay in disposition until you can actually wait some hours to see how the patient will react to be able to make that disposition. Um, so, Psychiatric emergency facilities will assess and treat on site for up to 23 hours and 59 minutes. So that's the, the observation model, the, the OBS model, uh, because once you go beyond, that's inpatient, right? So you, the idea is to stay uh, um, within those 23 hours. Although in our research in several different states in the United States, actually you, what you find out is that some of the place, it, it kind of depends on the reimbursement. So some states, instead of having a psychiatric emergency service, short, PADS for short. I know, some people think it's that little candy dispenser, uh, but PADS. Um, some, uh, some of the psychiatric emergency services actually had a length of stay of about 48 hours, but they would use the reimbursement of an inpatient stay and just have a, a reimbursement for the evaluation and an inpatient stay, a short inpatient stay. It can be exp expensive, definitely, to staff and maintain 24-7 a facility such as this one, and typically only makes sense for systems that, that have at least more than 3,000 psychiatric emergencies per year. Um, it's, a, it's definitely something of great interest to insurance companies because it can uh, save dollars in avoiding unnecessary hospitalizations that today uh, many times will happen. Uh, as you know so well, sometimes some of the boarding patients that are in our EDs, 
they are slated to go to inpatient, but if we really had more active treatment and more expertise in the ED, we could avoid uh, many of those um, hospitalizations. Some examples that we visited at John George Psychiatric Emergency Service in Oakland. We also visited two excellent facilities where uh, initiating some conversations on consulting, uh, receiving consultation from them at, in Arizona, Connections Arizona, uh, the Urgent Psychiatric Center in Phoenix, and the Crisis Response Center in Tucson. We also visited the Recovery Innovations in, Peo in Peoria, and we talked to several others in, in New York, Texas, and um, uh, Washington. So the John George model, I'll, I'll speak a little bit to that and then tell you what are the things that we're doing um, for Unity a little bit different than that. So the Alameda model, it, they call it the Alameda model, they average about 1,200 to 1,500 ver very high acuity psychiatric patients per month. Approximately 90% of them involuntary in detention. In fact, they are the hospital um, uh, destination for all of the involuntary holds in uh, the state, the, in the Oakland area, Alameda County. The focus that they put a lot of focus on the collaborative, non-coercive care involving a therapeutic alliance when possible. Very, very uh, good training on de-escalation skills, verbal de-escalation skills, etc. They, they, they average a, a five percent of patients placed on seclusions and restraints. Uh, just, just to give you an idea, the, in the rest of um, comparable facilities in the United States, the average is eight to 24 percent patients in seclusions and restraints. And this is a, they, they actually have a pretty good track record in terms of that, also in terms of their client uh, patient satisfaction surveys. Uh, one of the things that we learned uh, when we visited um, Oakland the first time was that they actually were able to negotiate with the ambulance companies in, the, in, in, the, in, in that area to create a medical clearance that is done in the field when the ambulance picks up the patient. So they were, they ha they were able to, first off, uh, eliminate police transports in Alameda County. So police, uh, they involved, it, it was a long discussion with police and EMS, and police got out of the business of transporting uh, individuals with mental illness, with, which, uh, let's be frank, it's a good thing. Uh, we should be transporting people in a behavioral health emergency the same way we transport people that have a heart attack uh, and not discriminate against. So they were able to do that and to create this workflow in which they, the ambulance comes to the scene, to the, the, to the field, does a medical clearance um, test, and then decides at that point who needs to go to the emergency room, the medical emergency room, who can go straight to the psychiatric emergency service. Any patient over 65 goes first to the nearest ED for medical clearance. And in their stats, about 35% come from directly from 11 other local EDs, and the rest of the patients actually come um, by ambulance uh, from the field. They were able to reduce the local ED boarding time with these 11 different EDs from 10 and a half hours to one hour and 20 minutes after they actually uh, created this model of receiving facility. Uh, John George actually discharges about 75% of the patients within 24 hours. All of that was very attractive to us. We thought that this was really uh, something that we wanted to um, learn um, from them. They published in the Western Journal of uh, Emergency Medicine that, that this is the the link to the, to the study, um, the, the study that actually uh, was able to uh, ascertain that reduction in boarding time. Um, so we know that, that Oregon has definitely a behavioral health access problem. Our emergency rooms, all of our emergency rooms are overcrowded, they're long waits, sometimes uh, uh, not as much behavioral health expertise as uh, we would like, uh, perhaps some few social workers, sometimes no adequate handoffs. And without the place to go, um, the patients that are having a behavioral health crisis, it just becomes a cycle uh, that of homelessness, suffering, suicide, arrest, incarceration, 
and back to the hospital. Um, and we feel we have uh, looked at these other models and created a solution. And, and I, I need to do a, a pause in the word solution here because, of course, this isn't a solution for the entire problem of mental health in our community. It is a solution for the, for the community in terms of being a receiving facility that actually can, can provide 24-7 um, crisis intervention, assessment, intervention, <coughs> treatment to a behavioral health crisis. So uh, the way we see Unity becoming, it's a hub of uh, behavioral health and a hub that will actually provide uh, also better handoffs. And I'll talk about that in a, in a second. But it definitely don't solve all the problems. So this is a unique collaboration between Oregon Health and Science University, Legacy, Adventist, and Kaiser. This is uh, pretty amazing because uh, these are competitors in other, in other areas. So we're actually, we are already being contacted by people all over the country asking us, how did you, how did you make this happen? Because this is very <laughs> magic. <laughs> so Unity Center for Behavioral Health, let's talk a little bit about it. So you will really have two big components. So one of the components is the psychiatric emergency service that I talked about with crisis stabilization, medication, crisis counseling, social workers. Uh, we will have in the building uh, family support. We'll have NAMI um, with family support uh, peers uh, located in the facility. Uh, peer support, uh, we are also, not only we will incorporate, incorporate peer support specialists, uh, so people with the lived experience of a mental illness or addiction that actually ha have a, a, um, a, cer a certification to become peer support specialists, they will be part of our um, skill mix, but we are also inviting other community members to co-locate in the building. We have built in the first floor a, a, a part uh, of the building, a, a room for peer support um, collaborators to be there with us, uh, as well as other community-based organizations that will be on site with navigators that will help the patients as they are discharging to navigate to the next level of care. Um, we, and that's the transitions of care um, teams and, and, of course, case management. In addition to that, this is a hospital that will have, here it says 101 beds. We are actually able to uh, have 102 beds. We just uh, looked at over again our design and, and development, and we have been, we, we have been able to um, put one more bed in the, it's a building that already exists, so has the walls, and that restrains some, how many beds you can actually have. Uh, the majority of the beds will be single occupancy uh, with uh, some double occupancy beds. Uh, and we will have basically uh, four adult units, so four adult units, and one uh, child and adolescent unit. In the child and adolescent unit, uh, currently Legacy has a, a manual 16 beds available. We're increasing that to 22. We felt really strongly that in, in the area of um, kids' uh, psychiatry, we are really uh, a provider that is a, we're, re we're a regional provider. We provide to the entire state of Oregon. Um, with the model of the PES, with the model of the psychiatric emergency service, we feel that uh, in, the, in the adult side, we'll be able to resolve many of the crises, many of the behavioral health issues and crises that we deal today uh, and actually return that individual to the community uh, within 24 hours. Therefore, in our design, there is a difference in beds between what you see today and this number of 10 uh, adult beds. We, are, we, have, we had to make that hard decision of reducing, but like I said, we have 50 uh, position in the PEDS, we have 50 recliners with the c capacity of serving up to 50 people a day. Um, which those are some of the individuals that are actually in our um, adult units today. We have built a space for community providers to navigate handoffs and strong uh, support, peer support built into the way we're going to operate. The majority of the providers, medical providers at Unity will be employed by OHSU and will be part of the OHSU faculty. OHSU will be moving their adult psychiatry residency and their child and adolescent fellowship to Unity. Yeah, Unity will serve also as a training site for um, 
ED residents, medical students, nurse practitioners, nursing students, and, and perhaps other disciplines as well. Actually, when we looked at the West Coast, this is what we could find. Uh, Oregon sort of missing that, that, that piece. Um, and we just, just as, a, as, a, as a, a point of reference, uh, looking at our annual visits um, to our EDs that are behavioral health related, we're looking at today 17,000, almost 18,000 visits per year in, in all of the uh, hospitals that are participating in this effort. The, the psychiatric emergency service will have, it says, it says 40, but in, in fact, we have 40 recliners in the, in, in, in the higher acuity area and 10 recliners in another area that we're designating as the living room, which will be a more, um, a less acute, uh, a, a more transition of care, discharging uh, um, area for patients. And um, we, all, we will also have eight rooms between seclusion and restraint rooms and calming rooms for, for people that might be having a hard time staying in the, in the therapeutic milieu of the psychiatric emergency service. And the environment is really designed to reduce agitation. Uh, there's a calming architecture, colors, et cetera, to create that environment of hope, of recovery, and of hospitality, really. Uh, and the milieu is kept safe through relationships that are caring and respectful. One of the things that we were very impressed in all of the psychiatric emergency services that we have visited is the fact that actually the staff is interacting with the patients at all times in this open area as opposed to having patients today uh, isolated in an emergency department room most of the time alone um, and, and isolated. So the differences about this model is the collaboration, really, of, of between the four systems. Uh, the community-wide effort, I mean, we have had participation of the city, the three counties. Uh, our peers are both uh, CCOs have been at the table at most of our discussions and, and been very, very um, positive about this effort. Um, EMS, police, police that is at the table with us and also many mental health and addictions providers that are at the table today um, creating a more intentional model for transitions of care. Uh, we also have been able to talk to our community and, and, and talk to the police about decriminal, decriminalizing the transport of um, patients with uh, issues of behavioral health and removing the police from that uh, transporting business. And so really doing the same thing that we saw happening in um, Alameda County, we're going to be doing in Multnomah County, most likely in Clack Clackamas County as well. Um, so this is just to give you an idea. Um, today, uh, when we look at um, the legacy data, we have about 48% of our patients arrive by ambulance, uh, 34 by car, um, foot, um, but 7% still arrive by police car. And I don't know about you, I actually the other day decided to go spend a day doing a, a, a just like a ride along with the police with the behavioral health unit. So I actually got to ride in the back of a police car. It's just not the place you want to be. Let's just say, <laughs> let's just say that. Um, so we have gone through great pains to uh, bring together physicians, nurses, and uh, professionals from our, all of our organizations to establish a medical stability criteria that uh, will be acceptable, if you will, uh, at Unity. Unity uh, will be, it's a freestanding um, um, psychiatric hospital. It's not freestanding insofar uh, it's not affiliated to a hospital because actually Unity is affiliated with Emmanuel. Unity will be a service of Emmanuel. All of our beds will be um, licensed through Emmanuel uh, Medical Center. However, we are a mile point two from Emmanuel. So in that sense, we don't have the same medical support that our current units actually enjoy. Therefore, we are wanting to err on the side of being more conservative. And so this is uh, basically the list of the patients that we will be able to accept. Um, and it's, is this uh, PowerPoint going to be um, 
available for folks? Yes. Okay. So, because it's this is a busy staff, uh, a busy slide. I'm not going to read all of it. This is worse, but <laughs> <laughs> but it's expectable because this is actually uh, what we're not going to be able to handle. Um, so basically, IVs and you know several different tubes and things that are not safe to have in an environment that. Uh, um, above and beyond everything, you're really looking at the safety of the patient. So um, basically, that's the list. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty extensive list, and we're still working uh, to refine some more. We're trying to have an all-encompassing list that actually includes both adults and adolescents, child and adolescent population. So the other thing that we have um, uh, worked on, it's what are some of the tenets, what are some of the principles that are going to guide uh, all of the care model um, all of the policies, procedures, and practices that we'll have at Unity. And um, so we, we really feel strongly about the tenets of trauma-informed care as being uh, the umbrella under which we will be functioning. So a philosophy that is really aimed at promoting safety, hope, growth, and recovery. And some of the key principles of trauma-informed care our principles that we, I'm sure we, we all in this room share, um, of safety, of trustworthiness, uh, transparency, peer support. Um, this has been actually something that, uh, I, and I, I, I may have seen Ann Casper here. We, we have had um, the involvement of peers um, and, and advocates in a lot of the, 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 the work we're doing from the very beginning. Um, some of our um, care model design groups have brought uh, quite a few people with the lived experience of being in a, in a psychiatric unit, of being in the AD, and being able to look with the eyes of the patient, not, um, which is fundamental. I think that, that inclusiveness is fundamental to the building of uh, unity and the realization of it as uh, the vision that we have. Um, so principles of collaboration and mutuality, of empowerment, both of the staff and the patients, voice, choice, cultural, historical, and gender issues involved in it so we can actually really be thinking about diversity and, and, and embracing that. Also, and that's dear to my heart because I worked for many, many years in, in, a, in a, um, more in the addiction side of behavioral health, if you will. Um, we will integrate mental health and substance use disorder treatment under the umbrella of unity. So we're, 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 we're going to be looking at a much more robust programming and, and skill mix that will bring that into um, the treatment that we can offer, not just the treatment that we can offer in the psychiatric emergency service and the units, but also in the, in the handoffs and in the very, very strict and big collaboration with uh, substance use disorder providers in our community. Um, we decided to um, use the telecare recovery, the recovery center clinical system, so it's a recovery model, to, to go with a recovery model in the adult side, uh, really looking at um, the, as, as you think about um, do, pr providing treatment uh, to individuals in a locked facility, that environment becomes your primary therapeutic intervention. Therefore, taking a lot of pains and care into, into creating a culture there that uh, is of healing and that is of hope and not of disempowerment, it's very important. And, and telecare has figured it out. I mean, they have come up with a very, very good, strong model which will be consulting and training our staff. Um, and the, in the PEED side, we will continue, we already use, and we will continue with the collaborative problem-solving uh, care model that has been so successful so far. Uh, it's shared also with the Providence um, system, and it's been um, um, very good in, in addressing uh, children and adolescents with uh, behavioral problems. Now I'm going to pause for a second to say that we will be, all of that is not good if we cannot prove that it's good, if we cannot measure, right? So um, we will be looking at measurements that are meaningful, that are feasible, that are actionable, 
um, leading measures that not just the uh, um, lagging measures that we look at for three months, but leading leading indicators for quality, both in the PES as well as in our inpatient unit. And uh, this is a, a big list, uh, but basically we are working with some other psychiatric emergency services in the, in, in the U.S. that are creating a benchmarking um, system in which um, all of the psychiatric emergency services will be benchmarking against. And these are the domains timely, safety, accessibility, uh, being the least restrictive level of care, effectiveness, consumer and family-centeredness, and partnership with, with others. Those are the domains in which we will be creating metrics around uh, to see how we're doing and to be telling the story to our communities. Finally, I just want to say a few, a few words about the transitions of care. Um, model that we have created. So we created this transitions of care cabinet, a concept of people that actually, so we have the CCOs sitting at the table. Um, we have um, the treatment providers sitting at the table. So we have Cascadia, Central City Concern, LifeWorks, uh, Albertina Kerr, Trillium, um, DePaul, um, the Alliance for Culturally um, um, Competent uh, programs, and, and you name it. So many, many uh, of it's, and if I didn't name all of them, it's because the, the list goes on and on. And I mean, we have just in the Tri-County area, we have upwards to 40 uh, providers um, of behavioral health um, care in the outpatient arena. But so we, we have taken that on to be a, um, a, con a, con a convener of getting together pro to, to um, come up with models of transitions of care for adults, for adolescents, and for culturally specific groups. And that we actually conducted um, three uh, mini Kaizens, if you will, process improvement um, opportunities. And we fed those ideas back to the, the cabinet. And now we have created work streams in which we will be working closely together. And that ran, uh, runs the gamut. Uh, it's, uh, one of them is, of course, integration of medical records. Um, how can we be um, having electronic uh, information sharing uh, and at the same time um, be compliant with HIPAA, et cetera? Um, but it runs also the use of peer supports in the transitions of care, the use of navigators in the transitions of care, the use of, of family peer supports in the, in the transitions of care, because so many times if you just give folks that have just been in a big crisis just a little address with a phone number, it's just not going to make it. We started working on this, um, I want to say six, maybe more than six months ago. And, and for, at first, we were looking more about the seven-day measures, you know, the seven-day follow-up measure. Many of you must know what I'm talking about, is the, the, the CCO and hospital uh, measure of providing, a, attending a follow-up um, um, outpatient um, uh, appointment in the community after a discharge from inpatient. And that actually became much more than that now. And not only all of the hospitals have been able to improve in their measures because of this work, but also it, it got way more um, um, involved in so far what comes after seven days, what comes after that first appointment. How can we, how can we work together to create um, more seamless transitions of care that are less complicated for the consumer? And this is just a, a picture of one of our Kaizens. We had an incredible participation from the community. We truly had, we had Providence with us. We had uh, people from every single treatment program. We had physicians, we had nurses, we had social workers, discharge planners. It was really, really um, very, very good. So the plan opening for Unity is uh, in November of 2016. The le legacy is fundraising for the capital investment because the building w uh, where we are going to locate Unity is where it used to be uh, uh, the Holiday Park um, um, Hospital, if you, some of you may remember that. So it's in the Lloyd District, Lloyd, Lloyd District area. And so Legacy owns that building and uh, Legacy is fundraising that, therefore to uh, build the insides. I mean, we're really uh, taking it to the studs and rebuilding the insides of four of the floors of that building. The first floor we're taking 
taking it over completely, and it's where the, the, the psychiatric um, emergency service will be located, and then three other floors. And we had also participation from Multnomah County. I mean, this is all was in the newspaper from Clackamas County, Washington County, and, and also from the city of Portland. A lot of support from many of our um, government partners. So with that, I would like to say thank you all and open up to a Q&A and, and just see if I can answer any questions that you have. Dr. Ferentinos, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions. I'd like to do something first, which is uh, to ask those people who are in the